Today is Wednesday, May 10th, 2017. Welcome to Episode 3 of the Barnhart Podcast. It's been an exciting week here in wherever I am. How are you doing, Ann? I'm good, good. Another beautiful week here and uh, glad to be back for Episode 3. Thanks for all the positive feedback that we've received from folks so far. Um, it was good enough that we decided that we'll go ahead and keep going with this. So glad to be here. Yes, the, bos- the positive feedback is appreciated, uh, though not necessarily expected, but uh, it's encouraging to, to say the least. Uh, in current news right now, there's a headline over on the Drudge Report. I don't know if you read that website frequently about a certain professional wrestler, K Faber, we might call him. Uh, he goes mm-hmm. by the name of The Rock. And he's mm-hmm. stating that he's considering a presidential run or political office run in the near future. I'm going to take a wild guess and say you might have a thought or two on this. Well, I mean, just very quickly reiterating what we've what we've talked about before and just saying, you know, I told you so. Look, these these professional wrestling people, they are honing in on this entire um, social political situation in the former United States, in the in the former Western civilization Christendom. And they realize that they have they've hit a vein here. And it's dawning on all of them that, you know, if Trump can do it, if Vince McMahon can do it, this is exactly what people are ripe and ready for. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to be hating on Dwayne Johnson. I mean, I, I, he seems like, he seems like a, a decent human being. I don't think his personal situation is, is exactly what it could be in terms of, um, I don't, I know he has a child. I don't know if he's married to the child's mother, blah, 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 whatever. He he seems like a decent human being, you know, but just reiterating the point that this whole business of politics and entertainment just completely crossing paths now and getting so completely tangled up with, with each other. I mean, I guess you, you could say that we should have seen this coming with the advent of, you know, Fox News and things like that, where slowly, slowly starting, I don't know, how long has it been now? 20, 25 years ago, somebody realized that news and entertainment needed to be mixed up together. And now that's kind of played out, you know, it, the, the culture is so degraded that even mixing news and entertainment together isn't working so well anymore. And so now they're having to go all the way into this professional wrestling and merge that into, into politics. And I hope it, it kind of flashes in everyone's mind images of, of the fall of decadent pagan Rome when they were having these, these games in, in the coliseums and the amphitheaters and so forth. And that's how people were entertained, that everything is just slowly, in fact, not not so slowly anymore, but just everything is degrading in towards that to where everything is about, it isn't about truth, it isn't about get, getting actual information, disseminating the news, as it were. Now what it is, is about just feeding the squealing masses entertainment and and then you know, deluding people into into believing that this entertainment is is some sort of adult, mature engagement with with ideas, engagement with politics, engagement with the governance of the society, and it's not. So, I guess just very briefly, one big told you so. Well, and this the idea of mixing news and entertainment is not exactly new, and and. Um the astute observer would have noticed that the title that I gave last week's podcast, K Faving Ourselves to Death, was a reference to uh, the book Amusing Ourselves to Death, in which the author, uh, Neil Postman, if I remember correctly, made the point that the combination of news and entertainment, and specifically the effect of television on the news, uh, on the uh, information consumers of, of America, was going to lead to a situation where we prize entertainment over anything else. And he was pointing at uh, 1984. Uh, or making making the distinction between 1984 and and um, a brave new world, and and uh, he was suggesting that that really it's the brave new world's what we have to be concerned about, really the one coming to pass, and nobody really caring about it. And by the way, when that book came out, he was he was making the reference to the the height of the television age, you could say, in the 80s. Who was the president? Mm-hmm. 
a movie actor and, and a movie and, actor, yeah. And, and this guy we're talking about, The Rock, he's not just a professional wrestler; he's also a professional movie star. Uh, he's probably made a lot more money doing that than he ever did wrestling. So, it, that's a trifecta there. It's, you got the entertainment angle, you've got the the movie angle. I'm sh- I'm sure there's something else. In this. Well, he's a football player, so yeah, that that appeals to. Um, all, all the legitimate sports fans out there who wouldn't uh, look at, uh, at at professional wrestling as real or something to look at. So um, I don't know what he stands for or how polished he is uh, uh, in terms of an extemporaneous speech, but who knows? Good writers, you can pr- probably be prepped for anything. Well, I mean, if you can put Obama, <laughs> if you can just put what Obama, I was say. In the- <laughs> and the other the other point it seems to me is that you kind of you kind of hinted at this that this whole business of having our civilization collapse in front of us, this farce, uh, this political farce with Trump and so forth, and also, and, you know, I can self-flagellate with this, this business of what's going on in the church with the uh, Bergolian anti-papacy and just having daily fodder to for for discussion in terms of things like this, it feeds into Facebook, it feeds into social media, and I think that people, and I've been making this point in a roundabout way for years and years, is that the line between actual current events and things that are happening and entertainment has crossed a line such that you know, people are people are happy to see these things happening because it gives them something to do and something to talk about. And also in a certain way, and again, I can self-flagellate with this, ways in which people think that they can display how brilliant they are. And, oh, look, I'm going to write, I'm going to write all these sorts of things, whether it be a 4,000 word essay or whether it just be snarky one-liners on Facebook or on Twitter or something like that, that people are luxuriating in this. Even people who are arguing how horrible it is and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, well, do they really want it to stop or do they do they view this as being quote unquote good for business or at minimum do they view it as being um, good for allowing me to show off and and uh, put my put my dazzling intellect and my rapier wit on display on the internet and on social media and again don't bother sending me emails about this because I fully realize that there's a there's a large degree of hypocrisy with with someone like me saying this because i'm i'm at this point i'm literally living off of this stuff i mean what happens when the immaculate heart triumphs if hopefully and hopefully it will here very very soon it might be might be in a matter of just a few hours from now um what what happens to me well Best case scenario, if I survive the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, it's I'm gonna have to get a I'm gonna have to get a, an honest job and do some sort of honest work. I mean, and I'm, I use the word honest with complete liberty here. I, I, I'm what am I gonna have to talk about on the internet? I mean, th- this is I, we should all pray for the day. We should all pray for the day when I have absolutely nothing to say on the internet. Um, I of course I don't use. Facebook or I've quit Twitter. I don't do any of that stuff anymore. I mean, would that it were that I had absolutely nothing to say on the internet and I needed to go back and really buckle down and figure out a way. And if the, if the triumph of the Immaculate Heart happens, then I will be able presumably to go back to work and go find a janitorial job or do something um, other than this, would that it were. But I think there's really a sense that a lot of people look at these bad things that are happening and say, ooh, this is fun, or ooh, this is good for business. And uh, we all need to keep that uh, kind of in the forefront of our minds as these dark days move on. I agree with the idea that Facebook and social media is exhibiting a type of um, mental illness that has been festering for a while, a desire to you know, to claim our 15 minutes of fame. And I'm sure we could talk a whole lot more about that, and I don't want to – I don't want to go too too long on this topic. Um, I, I think we could even call it a species of narcissism. And yeah, I, I, I once did a video about narcissism that goes on for three hours, and I was just scratching the surface. So yeah, we should probably move on to the next topic. Indeed. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we discussed North Korea, and North Korea has been back in the news again, whether it's the liberal media being all 
upset that, uh, hey, the, the carrier strike group we, that Trump said we were sending over there, no, it was never really going over there, or the ineffectual uh, references that we're going to deploy forces. What thoughts do you have on the news or, or the, the events with regard to North Korea over the last couple of weeks? Well, um, I had a really good conversation the other day, and um, the point of it was that the person I was speaking to and and I, I think we had both read the same article. And uh, the point of this article was, you know, North Korea is doing these quote unquote failed tests and failed launches. And oh yeah, and the, the big the big military parade they had. One of the one of the assertions was that the the missiles that they were rolling down the street were actually paper mache. Well, I mean that that might be completely true. I mean, goodness knows with North Korea. But the point that was made about these so called failed launches is that if they were testing, if they were testing um, how to launch, deploy, and detonate an electromagnetic pulse device it would look exactly like what's going on right now. And so they're launching these things. And the, the, the point of electromagnetic pulse devices is that you launch something way up into the, into the atmosphere, way, way, way up, and then a nuclear bomb is, de- is detonated up in the atmosphere, and the electromagnetic pulse that is generated by that nuclear detonation the higher the device is, the bigger the cone, you know, the blast cone, and the larger the space on the surface of the Earth that would receive this electromagnetic pulse coming off of this nuclear detonation. And in theory, what that is supposed to do is that it will burn out all um, electronic circuitry and so forth. And so presumably anything, any electronic circuitry that has not been specifically hardened to withstand something like this will be permanently blown out and will have to be completely remanufactured and replaced. So goodbye, Internet. Cars won't run. Um, any, any of you who've read that book, you've read the book. What's it called? One second after or one minute after? Um, oh, it's terrifying. It's absolutely horrible to read. But that is the premise of this entire book is that there's an electromagnetic magnetic pulse detonation over North America. And, you know, within a, a very short, short time span, a matter of weeks or just a few months, 90 percent of the population is dead. And I think we've kind of talked about that. In fact, I talked about that recently on another interview that I did um, with a with a prepper web, uh, a prepper channel on on YouTube. And we were talking about these ideas. But the point is North Korea, and we, we didn't touch on this when, when you and I discussed it, if they, are, if they are looking at detonating an electromagnetic pulse device, it, the tests would look almost exactly like what they're doing right now. And, you know, they, they can be all Dr. Evil and coy about it and shrug their shoulders and say, oopsie, um, that was a failed test when in fact, maybe it wasn't, maybe it did exactly what it's supposed to do. Maybe they're testing, launching something up and then detonating it remotely from the ground in order to affect this electromagnetic pulse. So I just wanted to put that out there and follow up on our North Korea discussion. You know, I had not heard that before and that's kind of a scary thing to think about, to be honest. And, and yeah, you think about this, probably the North Koreans are not building their missiles all by themselves. And the technology to launch a missile multi-stage, put it in orbit and bring it back down to within a mile or two of where you want it to go down. That's not exactly new technology. That's been around for a while. So they could probably get that from someplace else. I don't know, China, Russia, Iran, Whoa. Pakistan. I mean, <laughs> there are a few different places where you could possibly get that, whether it's you know state sanctioned or you paid somebody enough, uh, bribed them or whatever. Yeah, sure. but the idea how many times has, that we know of has an EMP been been activated, not counting Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That wasn't the point. There were EMPs there, but it didn't matter. And yeah. another, another thought that came to mind, if they are testing EMPs, what better place to deal with the North Korea where there's nothing really electronic to screw up? So who would know it? Exactly. I mean, those those photographs uh, making the point about the disparity in the economies where, in, you know, South Korea to the south and China to the north are just lit up like Paris, you know, and there's this huge void of black in the in the in the photographs taken from either 
high airplanes or generally from orbit from surveillance satellites. It and North Korea is just, it's just night black. And day. Yeah, it, it's literally night and day. So it, they would have they would have little to lose um, just brainstorming about what the China, how would the Chinese benefit from an EMP blast being detonated over North America? Well, they could roll in. The Chinese army could just roll in uncontested. If if something like that happened, and if the the electronic infrastructure in North America was genuinely eliminated, it would be the Chinese chance to roll into the North American continent, all of the infrastructure would be there with the exception of they would have to then come in and rebuild all of the electronic infrastructure. But, you know, there's how many of them are there? There's like 47 billion of them. So, you know, they probably don't view public enormous public works like that to be any big deal. I mean, look at what the Chinese are doing in order to keep people busy they're building entire cities, enormous, huge cities that then sit completely empty. And they just do stuff like that to, to make work for people. Oh, and in, in terms it, of rebuilding the electronic infrastructure, I mean, pretty much every single component involved of the discussion that we're having right now, the computer, the microphone, the cabling, uh, all three computers here that I'm, that I'm using – where are they? They're not made in Texas. They're not made in Japan anymore. They're not made in Taiwan. Yep. They're made in China. All of That's it. Right. So That's I, right. So it's not like it's not like they would have to rebuild much of anything. It's probably already sitting in warehouses in those empty cities that they built for make work, ready to be put on uh, whatever uh, a boat, Car- a plane, cargo ships, cargo ships. Yeah, and just taken, take it across the ocean, dump it off, and you know it would take a while. And the, but then you know you've got. Every all of the Americans on the ground dying per per the as how it's described in in that novel one second after or one minute after, um, you know, Americans would all be dropping dead um, like flies. So that would be taking care of itself. Anybody showing up with supplies and any semblance of order is going to be welcomed with open arms. And that's a scary thought. I hadn't quite thought yeah. of it that way. Yeah, thanks a, thanks exactly. a lot. I'm, I'm going to sleep well tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do what I can. <laughs> it's all sunshine and happiness and rainbows here with me, isn't it? <laughs> oh, goodness. Right, let's change topics then. Uh, follow, okay. follow Another follow-up topic. Uh, following mm-hmm. up on something we talked about two weeks ago with Ashton Kutcher. Uh, Jared Kushner. Darn it, I keep getting those names messed up. <laughs> One seems about as real as the other. Indeed. Um, you made a comment. Is there a priest out there who would be willing to offer one mass or I don't know if it's it, it, it's a one mass only or, or to offer masses in succession for the reversion or conversion of the apostate Ivanka Trump and the Kushner family? Have you heard anything back from anybody on that? I um, haven't heard, but kind of want to want to formalize it in the context of this podcast. Um, is there is there a priest out there who offers the the Holy and August sacrifice in the Gregorian rite, the rite of Pius V, or, you know, heck, I'd take divine liturgy too. Um, no problem. Can we get one mass or divine liturgy offered for the reversion of Ivanka and for the conversion of Jared and Ivanka's children? I mean, if we're going to be serious about this, we need to, you know, put our money where our mouths are. Just one. If if there's any priests out there listening who have any open days on their schedule at any point within the next uh, several months, you know, shoot us shoot us an email to that. uh, What is it? Podcast at Barnhart dot biz podcast at Barnhart dot biz. Yeah. And and, uh, I'm pretty sure talking about putting your money where your mouth is. I'm sure that a listener or two would be willing to offer the mass stipends to make that happen. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I, I know how munificent um, my listeners are without any question. And I would certainly be willing to direct funds to such a to such a thing as well. No problem. And, and um, for, the, for the non-Catholics, what we're talking about here about uh, mass stipends, uh, when a priest says a mass uh, for a certain intention, you're not paying for the mass per se. That's simony. That that was condemned long, long ago. What you're yes. doing is you're, you know, to, to paraphrase the gospel, the worker's worth is higher. It's uh, depending upon where you are, it's like 10 or $20. There's nothing the priest is going uh, to get rich on. In fact, it's probably not even enough to live on, to be honest. Oh, but no, it, it's, it's not it's, enough to live on. No, it's, 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 it's just it's walking a, around money. Yeah, it's, it's basically uh, time 
money to, to, to schedule to have it done. And in, in terms of what it costs to, in terms of a mass stipend to have a mass said, that it, it, the metaphysical exchange rate is literally infinite. And, and you're the financial analyst. If you want to explain that, go for it. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, um, it, it said that having the holy sacrifice of the mass offered for you while you are yet alive is is one of the most incredibly powerful grace events that a human being can have, which is why I ultimately, at some point, I already have three days a week in which my benefactors have the Holy Sacrifice off- offered for the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and I'd like to get it to seven days a week so that every single day of your life, you know, benefactors of mine can wake up and say, well, the Holy Sacrifice is being offered for me today. Um, and that's what built a lot of the churches and a lot of the chapels in Europe is that these Church, to some extent, churches, and to a large extent, the side chapels. When you go into a, a church that was built before uh, the, the, basically the middle of the 20th century, whether it be in Europe or in North America or anywhere, there's the there's the main altar, but then also there's all of these little altars along the side. And the reason why those were built is because a there used to be so many priests that they needed all of those altars so that everybody could offer their mass every day, but also because certain families or certain, um, for example, trade groups and and so forth. Like for example, um, in Rome, there's a church that was built by the trade organization of butchers, and then there's a church that's built by the trade organization of bakers, or maybe inside a certain church, you'll go and you'll read the little didactic about this and such side altar and this and such church. The second altar on the left was paid for and built by, let's say, this and such family so that masses could be offered for their family members. In in perpetuity, it was thought, you know. And so this business of having the holy sacrifice of Calvary offered for you while you're yet alive, let's get that done for these people. I mean, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful to have spiritual bouquets and everybody praying rosaries. And that's, that's, again, that's a very Catholic, trad Catholic term, spiritual bouquets. When a bunch of people commit and get together to, to praying the holy rosary for one specific thing, that's called a spiritual bouquet. So people can like sign up for something like that. And then it can be presented to somebody, a a priest or someone who's in the hospital or something like that, that, oh, look, three dozen people prayed the prayed the um, glorious mysteries of the rosary for you and and so on and so forth. Um, That that's fantastic. If we can do it with it, we can have masses offered for people too. spiritual bouquet is kind of a. You know, you think about it in terms, almost a hippie term, it'd be more appropriate in a sense to think of it as a swarm attack because in Catholic yeah. thinking, we are members of the church militant. This is a militant, fight. This yeah. is a fight we're in. And when you pray together in common, it is a, it is a swarm attack on, on, uh, on the purpose of, of the intention. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that I just wanted to put that into the context of a podcast that, yeah, let's, let's get serious about this. I mean, if we, if we really care about these people and their souls and we really believe in what the church teaches you can't just say that because you because you support Donald Trump politically or even the weak sauce of I support Donald Trump politically just because he was not Hillary Clinton. Um, well, then, if his daughter is an apostate and his children are unbaptized and and these people are living and holding themselves out as Jews, we can't just pretend that that isn't happening and that isn't real. It's as, it's as much real to people who you consider to be, quote unquote, on your team as it is people that you consider to be your enemies. That's, I, I think that's a big problem in our society is that people are willing to blow off enormous questions like this and pretend that they don't exist and pretend that they're not a problem as long as the person is on your quote-unquote team. What I'm hearkening back to is back in the day when I lived in Denver and, you know, an athlete, a Denver Bronco, a football player, superstar football player on the team, you know, everybody rah-rah, he's so great, and then he get busted for dealing drugs or often beating up his girlfriend or both or something like that. Or beating and up his girlfriend while dealing drugs. While dealing drugs, yeah. And people would just people would just blow it off and because he was on our team. And then 
you know, or for example, when some criminal thug football player, when he played for another team, everybody would talk about what a thug he was. But as soon as he got traded into the Denver Broncos, quote unquote, our team, then all of that went away and he was an angel and a good guy and could do no wrong. And that always used to really strike me about how willing people were to blow horrible stuff off as long as you were on, quote unquote, the right team. So it's gone from the context of sports now into the context of politics. And even trad Catholics are willing to just, you know, bat their eyelashes, shrug their shoulders and overlook something that should horrify, horrify all of us. Formally apostatizing? That, I mean, that's hardcore. Most people just kind of fall away, da 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 what she did was to formally on paper renounce her baptism and renounce Christ and renounce his divinity and renounce his salvific work on the cross on paper formally. Dude, that is that is serious, serious business. And if we're serious about this, then we need to act and do what we can. And the most powerful thing it would seem to me is to have a mass offered. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for priests or folks who want to uh, put up a stipend for that, the email address is podcast at barnhart.biz. And speaking of folks who email that address, uh, a question we got from listeners, from a few listeners, actually. And why don't you allow comments on your blog or your videos? Um, common sense. Have, have you ever seen comment threads, especially on YouTube? YouTube is a cesspit. It is an absolute cesspit. There are people that troll on YouTube and I, I'm convinced that they sit around and their entire purpose of, of being on comment threads on YouTube is to write the most spectacularly evil, disgusting, perverted thing that they can that they can come up with and put it on a YouTube comment thread. OK, so that's YouTube blogs, et cetera, et cetera. It's all the same. My position is, is that. Whatever I do, whether it be my website or my YouTube channel, I am morally responsible for absolutely everything, everything that appears on my website, whether I wrote it or not. If I cut and paste something, if I cite an article, then I have to be absolutely certain morally that there's a licit moral framework in which I am working. I can't just have... Uh, comments on my channel or my website publish this in the name of, I don't know what, what you, you call it for, you know, free speech or whatever. Give me a break. That's so lame and say, well, everybody has a right to be heard. No, actually everyone doesn't have a right to be heard. And if you out there in the world, if you have something to say, then what you can do is you can set up a website of your own and you should write it down or you should record a video and you should post that. And if what you say has any generates any interest, it has any value, et cetera, et cetera, then people will go to your website or your, your YouTube channel and they will consume what it is that you write or that you say. This notion that anyone who writes or presents any sort of information in any way is somehow bound to publish the the comments and the feedback of the people who read or watch what they produce. This this is insane. What are you talking about? So you're going to tell C.S. Lewis, okay, C.S. Lewis, you can write mere Christianity, but you have to publish absolutely every feedback letter that anyone sends you. And if you don't, you're some sort of a coward or something. The other thing, and I, I'll keep reiterating this and reiterating this and reiterating this, guys, there's, there's people out there who are crazy, who are mentally ill, who should be institutionalized, who are running around in, in especially in the post-Christian world, because, you know, one of the, one of the byproducts of this whole psychoanalytical culture that we live in, this descent into this evil of psychoanalysis, is that nobody can be called crazy or institutionalized, institutionalized anymore, especially the people who need it the most. And so there's people running around and there's people all over the internet who are reading and perusing and seeing this stuff. 
And then they're sending, they're sending in things. I morally enabling someone's schizophrenia, um, someone's psychopathy, someone's diabolical narcissism who wants to, you know, scandalize people under the cloak of anonymity on, on the internet. I, I can't morally facilitate enable any of that. So, no, there will never be any comments anywhere on anything that I do. And it's not because I'm some sort of a coward and I'm not willing to defend my positions, obviously. It's because there's, there's a very sizable moral responsibility and culpability that goes with this. And, and I have thought long and hard about these things. And would my, would my traffic go through the roof if I enabled comments on, on my website? Well, of course it would. And that, that is, in fact, why most people who have blogs and websites, that's why they do it. That's what they allow it, because they enjoy the kick of logging into their stats and seeing this inflated page view rate that they have, because people are looking at comments, checking back and looking at a post multiple times over and over again, um, people engaging and going to the same post over and over and over again to see if anybody has responded to their comment and blah, blah, blah. It's all this kind of this narcissistic feeding of, am I, am I getting feedback here? What are, what are my site stats? Sure, my stats would go through the roof. I don't care. I don't care at all. And in fact, it's just, it's just a, cons- a consumption of additional bandwidth for me. I don't want to do that. And there's the whole moral problem with all of that, too. So there's your answer. And if it wasn't already abundantly clear to anybody listening, because it was mentioned earlier, any groups or pages on Facebook that purport to be Anne, that's not you, is it? Oh, no, absolutely. Those are they're called fan pages. And when I first did the Koran burning in um, April of 2011, they started popping up. And I contacted Facebook and they said that, no, that's called a fan page and it's perfectly within the rules of Facebook for people to do that. These pages were using the first person pronouns, holding themselves out as me, Anne Barnhart, I believe, da, 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 da. And it wasn't and, me. And, and there was using nothing, your photo. Using my photo, um, cross posting everything. It's not, it, it wasn't the, the using of my photo reposting and cross posting. Cause I've said over and over again, man, I'm not writing this stuff to exercise my fingers. I'm not making these, these videos because it's particularly fun or I enjoy it. Obviously. I mean, it's like pulling chicken teeth, getting me to do stuff like that. Um, and I'm done with videos as we've discussed before. This is just, this is something just for me to do because I, I felt, and people keep telling me you need, you need to do more if you're not going to write as much, if you're not going to write, you know, a full 2,500 word essay every day, you need to do something. You need to do a podcast or something. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Um, but, uh, no, no, I, it's, it's very bad. It's very narcissistic. And I just, I don't want anything to do with any of that. So if you see something online that, uh, purports to be officially or unofficially related and, and people can comment, Anne has nothing to do with that. I have that. nothing to do just, with it. Just make that clear. The, the only place that I exist on the internet is barnhart.biz, and I have a YouTube channel and this podcast. Can you say, There's nowhere else where I officially exist, I don't think. I quit Twitter because they started just turning communist and, and throwing everybody that wasn't on the, on the far left off. So I don't want anything more to do with Twitter. I had like 8,600 followers on Twitter. And I don't know what the coefficient, how many of those were bots and how many were fake, but you know, 8,600 followers on Twitter is a, is kind of non-trivial for just a, for just an individual person. I'd shut that down without hesitation. I miss the format. I miss the format of being able to put links to interesting articles that just kind of lived on the side of the barnhart.biz website without having to make a full blog post. I miss that format, but it's not worth it. I'm not going to support these these wildly corrupt, um, ev- these evil ideologues who are operating. I mean, I guess you can make the make the argument that any engagement that anyone has in any way with Google or Apple or Microsoft or any of these companies that you're morally compromised. Um, I try to be as detached from that as possible, but I think there's a certain extent to which 
you know, in order to have the, the physical, the physical machinery to do this stuff, you, you have to engage with these companies to some extent. So maybe I'm being a hypocrite, but I'm just not willing to, uh, to do this anymore. And yeah, I think, can you confirm this? So barnhart.biz YouTube channel, and then this podcast, I think that is the only place on the internet that I live. Uh, aside from the places where the podcast has been uh, published in a directory, uh, that's it. Yeah, as yeah. Far as, as far as I know. Yep. And I, I, I do know how to use Google, and I, I have used it to try to find <laughs> things like this. So uh, I'm pretty sure that that's it. Yep. And I think we've pretty much beaten that topic to death. I think so. Uh, let's move on to something else. Okay. Okay, so recently the Knights of Malta suffered an implosion of sorts. What's the larger significance of this? And well, what and, and if if you have any, what what kind of inside information, leaks, reliable rumors, Russian WikiLeaks, scoops, <laughs> and what what do you have what what do you know about this? Well, um the first thing to remember about all of this in terms of the Knights of Malta especially and also to a large extent what's going on inside the Vatican is that what it's about first and foremost is money laundering. Money laundering, money laundering, money laundering. Okay, so always keep that in the front of your mind. Um, all this business with all of these, you know, pseudo NGOs, non governmental organizations, um, and then things like the Knights of Malta, and now the church. I mean, that's that's largely what the objective, the Freemasonic objective, the Soros objective is with regards to the church is to just. You know, here you have the Roman Catholic Church, you have the Vatican City State with its own bank, with its own sovereign banking entity. And this has been viewed for, you know, the better part of the last, oh, you know, since things got terrible 50, 60 years ago, and maybe even before that as well. Um, the whole thing has just been catnip for money launderers and money laundering and you you just have to be completely deluded to not see and understand this so, so was the movie godfather part three actually predicting or was they already reporting on something or hinting at something that was already happening i am shocked and offended that you would even imply that i've ever seen the godfather part three no i'm just kidding i've totally seen it um yeah Things like no, that. No, you, you read about it on Wikipedia, of course. <laughs> no, I read about it on Wikipedia because I would I would never corrupt my my eyes with with such such foolishness and such nonsense uh, <laughs> and bad acting by Sofia Coppola. Um, <laughs> no, I've totally seen it, and yeah, of course, there's truth in all of that. Um, truth in in the sense that money laundering is a huge aspect of all of this. So. With the, with the sovereign military order of the Knights of Malta, there's these factions. The big faction is the German faction. They're using the whole thing as a money as a money laundering center, um, and so they get some huge. They call it um, a, a bequest in a in a will or something like that. The name, the person whose name is attached to this doesn't even exist. And it was for like $118 million or something. And so these German Knights of Malta, they see this, they're drooling, they're salivating, and they just, they want to use the, the order of the Knights of Malta to launder money you, in cooperation, presumably with the Vatican Bank. I mean, this money went through New Zealand. It's, it's all so corrupt and so dirty. So, Always remember that in the front of your mind, what this is about is about money laundering. Now, in our study of diabolical narcissism, we know that diabolical narcissists are all about power. And the two main subsets of power as a category are money and sex. OK, so money and sex are two subspecies of the manifestation of power, especially with regards to diabolical narcissists, which these people are now just crawling all over this. So here's what happened. There's basically three ethnic factions within the so sovereign military order of the Knights of Malta. There's kind of what we'll call the German faction. There's the Anglo faction. Um, and there's the Italian faction. So um, the, the man who was the Grand Master is an Englishman, English nobility. And he's obviously in the Anglo faction. The problem with the Anglo faction is, is that it does have a problem with having been infiltrated by sodomites. And there's a, there's a sodomite presence among these people. Now, I'm not saying that the former Grand Master himself is a sodomite, but I do know that there are plenty of people running around in that circle of the Knights of Malta, Anglos running around in that circle, 
who are sodomites or are very sodomite friendly at minimum. Okay. So what the Germans did being smart is that they went to the Italian faction of the Knights of Malta and they said, look at all these fags, look at all these English fags. Do you all, do, is that what you want? Do you want to continue to have the Knights of Malta be ruled by all of these fags? Look what they're doing and look what they tolerate. And this and such guy that they run around with in, in, in England. Oh, look, they had a sacristan in their chapel who was convicted of, of um, molesting boys and blah, blah, blah. And the other thing is what they do is they make this into a traditional Catholicism thing. They use this and they leverage this against traditional Catholicism because the Anglos tend to be the ones who are more traditional, like the old mass, you know, dress up in the regalia of the sovereign military order of the Knights of Malta. And again, I'm not intrinsically against these things. I'm not intrinsically against wearing, you know, beautiful, specific vestments. I'm not against I'm not against anyone in the church wearing uniforms, vestments, anything like that, any more than I'm against the the guards who are guarding the tomb of the unknown soldier at Arlington National Cemetery wearing their dress uniforms and looking like a million bucks all the time. Because that in of itself should be, in a healthy situation, in a psycho-spiritually healthy situation, that's showing honor to whatever you're doing. In, In the case of the tomb of the unknowns, it's showing honor to the fallen dead. In terms of the church, nobility, things like that, in the church, you're showing honor to God. In terms of nobility, it's almost in a sense that you're showing honor to the nation itself, the people themselves, that saying, look, I care enough about this that I'm willing to put on these fancy clothes and go through these ceremonies to show that this actually matters. So I'm not against that. It's one of it's one of Satan's ploys that he's infiltrated that culture of showing respect for institutions within society from the church on down, that he's infiltrated that with these sodomites. And so what the Germans did is they went to the Italian faction and the Italians are clannish and they're dumb. And he, and the Germans said to the Italians, Oh, look at all these fags. Look at all these English fags. You don't want to put up with that. You don't want to tolerate that. Do you vote, vote for us, go, go in a voting block with us and stick with us, and we'll we'll get rid of all these fags. Now, you'd have to, the reason I said the Italians were dumb is you'd have to be dumber than dumb to not realize that there are a bunch of fags amongst the Germans, too. So, you know, <laughs> Italians can be, can be very, very dumb, and that's exactly what happened. So they've elected now this interim Italian leader, and what he's going to do is he's going to completely enable the Germans to rewrite the whole thing so they have total control permanent control and they're going and they have and they will destroy the actual character of what the sovereign military order of the Knights of Malta is. The sovereign military order of the Knights of Malta doesn't it doesn't exist any longer. It's over. It is now just another money laundering NGO and it's a fairly good sized one and that is that is what this is all about. So the point the really big point here, and this is very important, especially for trad Catholics, is toleration of depravity is itself a species of depravity. And so when you tolerate these faggots and you don't drive these people out from among you, you can delude yourself for a certain period of time that, oh, they're harmless and, oh, there's always going to be people like that around and, oh, they're no big deal. But Satan is watching all of this, and he is absolutely delighted to leverage toleration of depravity, in this case in the form of faggots. He's completely content to leverage that against you, okay? It's not, you know, we we tend to think too much, too close and in too human of terms. If you're going to think about what what is Satan doing and what is his attack here, you have to pull the focus way back. Satan hates fags just as much, just as much as as anyone else. Satan finds fags disgusting. 
And Satan is delighted when people fall into these sins of Sodom, not only because they themselves are damning themselves, but now here is this massive point of leverage that he can start using against everybody. That's why this business of, of tolerance, 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 it's so evil. Toleration of depravity is itself a species of depravity. And if you put up with this crap and you don't drive these people out from among you, they will be used against you one way or the other. It will come back to bite you in the ass. And so we we have to man up and we have to start facing this and we have to start protecting ourselves And one of the main ways to do that is to not put up with this crap. If the Anglos, if the straight heterosexual, straight ahead, devout Catholic Anglos within the Knights of Malta, if that faction had stood up to these faggots that had infiltrated into that and driven them out of there, this might not have ever happened with, with the Knights of Malta situation. They would have had a firm base to be standing on. They wouldn't have been able to be leveraged and potentially even blackmailed in the way that this has happened, you see. And yes, anti-Pope Bergoglio is up to his eyeballs in this. He is up to his eyeballs with this German corruption. And just tangentially, um, one of the things that you need to understand about anti-Pope Bergoglio is that he is a pathological narcissist but he, and like so many of them, he's wildly insecure because he's not an intelligent man. And so a lot of what is driving anti-Pope Bergoglio and why he's in bed with all of these German heretics and sleaze bags and so forth is because he flunked out of the doctorate program in Germany. He went after he got his master's. He was sent to Germany to, to do a doctorate. And flunked out because he's dumb. He couldn't learn German and he he just clearly doesn't have the intellectual capacity for doctoral work. And so he flunked out. And so he's insecure about this. And he's constantly, constantly, constantly trying to convince himself that he's smart like the Germans and he's on on peer level with Germans. And he's constantly trying to ingratiate and trying to be part of that group. Because he knows that he's dumb deep down and he views the Germans as being the smart, the smart kids. Right. And he wants to sit at the table with the smart kids and he wants to be part of that social circle. And so, yes, he's up to his eyeballs in this. He's a liar. He's a backstabbing piece of crap. And that's why he's he's doing all this. And that's why he's jumping through these hoops to facilitate all this that was done to the Knights of Malta by the Germans. He Bergoglio gets a double benefit out of it. He gets to destroy um, one area of of traditional Catholicism still extant within the church. So he gets that benefit because he hates he hates God in his holy church and he hates all manifestations of solemn, reverent, pious worship of God. And the Knights of Malta, the trad faction within them, they they were doing things like that. So he's now completely destroyed that. And then the other benefit he gets is that he has, you know, basically kissed the butts of all of these Germans now. And he thinks that he has increased his own standing and his own power and his own popularity and his own elite ranking with these Germans who he's constantly chasing and whose, whose butt he's trying to kiss. So for anybody that's interested, that's the insight I have on the Knights of Malta thing. There you go. Something you mentioned about uh, not standing up to perversity or or any, any kind of wrong. It really made me think about um, a passage from St. Ignatius's uh, spiritual exercises where he talks about the way that the devil operates, the way that he attacks and that he fights like a coward. So it, it, as long as as long as the attacker shows strength in the face of the attack, the devil will flee. And if you want to encourage the satanic forces, show weakness. Show, show weakness. Yep, that's exactly show to- right. Show, show tolerance to their demands. Hey, just accept us and we'll be quiet. <laughs> You're yeah. right. Yeah, how, you, show, you show tolerance, you're going to get an exponential increase in it. Yep, we've been hearing that. Do you guys remember in the, what, late 1980s, early 1990s, when, when anybody suggested 
that sodomites wanted to be able to quote unquote legally marry each other that a great a great hue and cry would go up and you are crazy that's not what we want this is you're just being ridiculous this is alarmism etc 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 um and look where we are now look where we are now even just a few years ago when it was sta- people would say you know this this tr- cross dressing crap before this is done by the time you slide not too terribly far down this slippery slope you're going to be telling us that we should be letting men into into restrooms public restrooms with little girls and a great hue and cry would go up and you're crazy you're stupid that's not what we want blah 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 and look where we are um, and well, then, you, you say men, but they identify as women, so it's okay, right? Psh, shut up. Super nerd. Super nerd. Are you being sarcastic? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. Yep. So, they, and yeah, that that is how they operate. We see people with a brain in their head see the inevitable logical progression of all of these things. And what they do in the moment is they say, oh, you're crazy. So right now it's, you're crazy. We we don't want your children to, we're not going to force anybody to engage in sodomy. You're ridiculous. You're being alarmist. And sure enough, I, I posted um, a letter from a guy who was um, in, had to do ma- quote unquote mandatory corporate training for, for a major American aerospace engineering contractor, a name that absolutely everybody listen, listening to this would know. They took all of the white heterosexual men specifically, and in his group there were 30 of them or so, put them in a room with a faggot, and one of the things that they were forced to do, um, and this and this chap refused to do it and anticipates that he might lose his job over this, is the faggot would make you know the men couple off and then physically embrace each other, and they had to hold the embrace for at least 10 seconds. And the fag who was doing this, you know, tolerance training or whatever, told them specifically, the reason that you are, that we are doing this is to desensitize you to, to faggotry, to actual acts, actual sodomitical acts. This is sexual assault. This is sexual assault. And it's happening, and they're doing it with adults. Do you think that they're that they're not that crap like that isn't going on in the schools, and that that isn't directly on the agenda to force children in the public schools to? I mean, the mind reels, and we shouldn't even we probably shouldn't even speculate openly about this. We can all speculate about this pri- privately, but it's it's pretty easy to see the the sorts of sex acts that they would want children to engage in and force the children to do it. By either you know physical coercion, um, threats of failing grades, and shaming, shaming. You're a horrible, horrible, racist human being if you don't touch the genitals of this other child because we're this is all about tolerance. You know, it's that's where it's going, and that's that's how they operate. So trust your gut, trust common sense. Trust your ability to see clear logical progressions and where all of this stuff is going. And don't let these people browbeat you into thinking that your logical, rational thought about these species of depravity that just keep cropping up and cropping up and growing and growing in our culture, that, that it's no big deal and you're being an alarmist. Because clearly, just, just the last 20, 25 years is proof positive that we haven't been alarmist and we have been right. And our, our ability to rationally project logical consequences of things has been spot on. Don't let people get you to stop thinking in a certain sense. And then also stand up to this crap, stand up to it. He was there. He was the only man. The man who sent me the email was the only man in this room of 30 heterosexual white men he was the only one who refused to participate in that. That is terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. And the solution, as you mentioned earlier, to this and many other problems, to the insanity, the perversion, and the nonsense in the world, is going to be the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And speaking, you know, we, we ended last show talking about the uh, Catholic Church calendar. And there is a very significant anniversary coming up Saturday, 100 years 
since the apparition of Our Lady at Fatima. And I, for, for the people who aren't Catholic or cringing, oh, great, here we go with more churchy stuff. Uh, this is a little more significant than, than some. Uh, this is the, the biggest uh, manifestation of, of supernatural power since, since even the Old Testament. And uh, that, that, that particular anniversary will be in, in October. But uh, there, there are a lot of prophecies tied to this in addition to the, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. This, this is a big deal. Very uh, so big deal. How many people saw the miracle of the sun? Is it like 80,000 people? simultaneously witnessed that is that what it was and it was it was seen uh, i want to say it was seen from as far away as rome and uh so, but but some of the best uh commentaries were the first person accounts on the ground there at, at the muddy ground at, at fatima were by the local uh it was by the local editor of the masonic newspaper who had every reason in the world to laugh ridicule and disdain what was going on he's like hey i'm gonna show up these catholics once and for all maybe mm-hmm. And he was he, instead he ended up being a firsthand witness to describe exactly what happened with the celestial miracle. The fact that it had been raining for 12 hours straight and people were sinking down to their knees in the mud. And with, after the miracle of the sun, everybody the ground was dry, everybody's clothes were dry, no mud anywhere, uh, even the clothes were clean. Uh, so many manifestations, so many prodigies of grace. Um, and Our Lady made the point that her immaculate heart will triumph. Yes, uh, there's a slight condition to that. The Pope, in, in union with the, with the bishops of the world, uh, have to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart, and yeah, um, it's intensely tied in to all of the political, the socio-political um, developments and events of the last century. Because she said, you have to consecrate Russia, or else the heirs of Russia are going errors, e r r o r s. The heirs of Russia are going to run rampant over the face of the earth and it and it will result in an absolutely cataclysmic conflagration of war and so on and so forth and uh, guys we're in the midst of that and the heirs of russia presumably what that has to mean is communism and so this all it, it was 1917 world war one world war two then look at the Second Vatican Council, the failed Second Vatican Council. What that, what Vatican II should have done and what the bishops of the world wanted done, one of the primary things they wanted done, the reason to call the council was to denounce communism. And not only was communism not denounced, but Paul VI, um, who was a Freemason, a communist, and a sodomite, he completely thwarted all of that. All mention of communism was completely eliminated from the failed Second Vatican Council. And beyond that, he specifically negotiated with Moscow to have um, Russian Orthodox observers. And the Russian Orthodox Church is the KGB, okay? So he had these, quote unquote, Russian Orthodox observers come in and participate in the failed Second Vatican Council, and these guys were KGB agents. I mean, let's be honest, not that there aren't, not that there weren't plenty of, um, of cardinals running around that weren't also either explicitly or, or tangentially tied to the KGB at the time. Um, Bella Dodd said, it, said explicitly that she knew that there were, there were numerous cardinals in Rome who were actively on, who were communists and were actively working for global communism. But see, the heirs of Russia, Second Vatican Council happens, Paul VI promulgates his, his Novus Ordo Mass, his new Mass, and the world falls to pieces in 50 years. And now here we sit, and this is, the 100th anniversary is coming up, and it's, it's not superstitious, but it's reasonable to assume that this 100th anniversary is very significant, and, you know, this is being recorded on, what day is it today? Wednesday, um, the 13th is Saturday. Boy, I would just, I would encourage absolutely everybody to go to confession, not just go to confession, but make a general confession and just make sure that you're, you're spiffy and you're, you're good to go and we're ready to see what happens. And if nothing happens, so be it. I mean, you know, this isn't, this isn't a, a deal breaker or anything, but you know, it's, it's pretty compelling. The confluence of events, seeing everything that's going on, 
going back, harkening back to the beginning of this podcast, I mean, talking about these doomsday apocalyptic scenarios and involving North Korea and electromagnetic pulses and all of this, it's not unreasonable. You're not dumb if you look at these things and say, you know, there might be something going on, might be something going on here. So I would, I would just encourage absolutely everybody, do what you need to do, go to confession, make a general confession, and um, hopefully we'll be, we'll be back here next week, hopefully. We, we will be. And for yeah. the traditional Catholics listening who are aware of the 100-year prophecy and the warning that was made, uh, Our Lady said uh, that, that she will return. And, and this this was during the the apparitions of Adam. And she said she will return to ask for the consecration of of Russia to the Immaculate Heart, and that happened in 1929. And she's and, and the comment she said is that if the Pope does not follow through on this, he will suffer the fate of the King of France. And that was a reference to Louis the Sixteenth being beheaded almost a hundred years to the day after Louis the Fourteenth refused mm-hmm. the the request of Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque to consecrate uh, France to the the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Yeah. And part of the promise of that was that, that the French military would never, ever lose. And that sounds like a big joke. Yeah, but, um, right. <laughs> they, they, were, they, were, they were a very powerful military up to this point. I mean, at, at a human level, uh, you, you could see why, where, where – I mean, this was, these were the descendants of Charlemagne, for crying out loud. They, mm-hmm. they, uh, the, the, the descendants of Charles the, the Charles, Hammer. Charles uh, the uh, Hammer, yeah. Uh, Charles Martel, um, you know, they, they stopped the Saracens on the Western Front. I mean, they, they probably looked at that, you know, the, at, at this this offer of, of divine help. It's like, we don't need help. We have we have the strongest mil. It would be like somebody, you know, uh, approaching people in the Department of Defense saying, hey, you, you can have divine inter- intervention to help make sure the American military never loses. And, and you just see the people with stars on their collars look around, turn around and laugh. It's like, yeah. we have the strongest army there is. Yep. And then have somebody like Lithuania whip us. But, yeah. you know, the, the, the point being that, that the 100 years year it, um, warning, I, in my opinion, is 2029. It's not this year. But that said, I think there is something very significant, not just the 100 years of Fatima. We're also looking at the 500 year uh, yep. uh, anniversary of, of the Protestant uh, revolt. Revolt. Yeah. Uh, Luther, Luther's actions, if you didn't like the term revolt. The, the point being that this is not an insignificant year. And it's and, also uh, it's also the 300th, 300th anniversary of the founding of Freemasonry, the founding of the Lodge in London. Um, so all of these three things are viewed as being, you know, 500, 300, 100. They, they're all of a piece and they all go together. I did not know that last part. I'm going to have to you didn't know look that? that one up. No, no, yeah, no. I, yeah. I've, heard of, I've heard of 1789 and the significance there, which uh, you know, anybody with a $1 bill and sees, the, sees the, 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 the reference on the back of there to 1780 or – yeah, 1789. A lot of people are. are I'm sorry, not 1789. 17, 1776 <laughs> or 17? What? 1776 uh, is the Declaration of I'm, Independence. I'm confused in my revolutions here. 1789 was the French Revolution. Then yes. there was the American Revolution. But there, the the date in Roman numerals on the bottom of the pyramid on the back of the dollar one dollar bill also coincides with the founding of of um, of the. Freemasonic group in Westphalia. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Somebody okay. will figure it out and email us, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. But the point being, um, yeah, we, we, we say some things here that are you know, can give you the idea that uh, it's, it's dim and gloom. But no, the, in the end, there's going to be the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. We just have to – we may not survive the events between now and then. Mm-hmm. But in, you know, the history has already been written and, and, and uh, the victory has already been won. What happens between now and then is a matter of whether or not we're going to choose to be on the eventual winning side or not. Right, exactly. And in the interim between now and then, you know, the question of each one of us personally, our personal salvation is open and any one of us can fall into mortal sin today. And if we die that way, then it's probably not going to be a good outcome. Um, and such is the same with everyone else, which is why we have to continue to fight and we have to continue to stand up and and do what's right and not and not descend into narcissism ourselves, where we purge all love from our souls and in despair just start saying, you know what, I don't care about anyone else. I'm not going to waste my time on anyone else because that that is a species of narcissism. And if it goes far enough and you get self-centered enough and you despair enough, you too could become a diabolical narcissist. And then 
who knows what kind of horrific, horrific sin any of us could fall into. We're all susceptible to these things. So the point is, as always, just be on your guard and be diligent and fast and pray. And if I may offer a challenge to the listeners, spend more time in prayer this this next week than you do on social media or email. Whether you're emailing the podcast at barnhart.biz or anybody else, spend more time on, in, in prayer than, than uh, social media or any other kinds of uh, vain entertainments. Amen. All right. Speaking of which, I think we're coming up on an hour, aren't we? Uh, we're a little bit past it, I think. Wow. All right. That went by fast. It's been fun, though, and, and uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. All right. Thanks, Super Nerd. Thanks, everybody. God bless. <laughs>